Rare earths are the new black in mining and manufacturing. The world is waking up to these minerals, which are so critical on so many fronts, uh, from electric vehicles to mobile phones. And in Australia, they're on the government's top five priorities for recovery. Outside China, ASX-listed Linus Rare Earths is the largest player in the world. Linus has a mine at Mount Weld in Western Australia and a major processing plant in Malaysia and big growth plans, a new processing plant in Kalgoorlie for rare earths and potentially a new separator of the much sought after heavy rare earths, which at the moment are only processed in China. That would be in the US. At last week's AGM, Linus CEO Amanda Lacaz had a new chairman at her side, Kathleen Conlon. I sat down with Kathleen and asked her first what sort of opportunity she saw for the business. Kathleen Conlon, congratulations on the chairmanship of Linus. What an incredible time to take it on. What sort of opportunities do you see ahead? We are in an exciting phase of growth. We, we are in a market that's exploding. If you think about our end use markets, which are mobile phones, electric vehicles, wind turbine, water treatment, those are industries that are just poised for growth. And if you look at some of the recent examples, for instance, in Europe where they're, they're and, and in the UK where they're going to ban um, internal combustion, combustion engines, it's a very exciting time. That being said, we do have products that go into oil cracking and internal combustion engines. So it'll be, it'll be mixed in the response, but it's, we're poised for growth. And that was always the vision for this business. I was fascinated at the AGM this week that Linus is actually changing its name to Linus Rare Earths. Over the last number of years, the, the, the vision of the organization was always clear, which is to be the trusted, outside of China, rarer supplier into a globally growing business. And our strategy has been also about making sure that people who were designing products had confidence in the supply chain. And then COVID hit. And then COVID hit. Linus rare earths now when there's a, a lot more focus on supply chains, I guess. Well, I, th I think it's also about the value of being a peer play and the value of what we do and making it just very clear what we do because we are unique and therefore we should make it clear. So in terms of the last 18 months, you've had some extraordinary strategic challenges uh, that tilt from West Farmers, a, a huge Australian company, and of course all the internal politics in Malaysia where you've got this plant. Uh, how did you as a board handle those challenges? So we have, an, we, we have an excellent board. We have very high quality board directors who are very engaged and understand the business in depth. We also have a very strong management team. So in all of those things, we focus on how we create value and don't get distracted by what's going on. One of the things that Amanda brought, when, when Linus started up in Malaysia, it, it was politically quite difficult. And she, by moving to Malaysia, relocating her family, relocating the whole management team, really demonstrated a commitment to the local community that they had not seen before. And I think that commitment to the local community has stood us in very good stead. But the board just focuses on what is the fundamental value that we have in this business and how do we create a, a better business for the community and a better business for the shareholders. You had a big win this year. You actually got the three-year license renewed up in Malaysia with conditions. Are you confident that you're going to be able to deliver on those conditions, building uh, a, a cracking and leaching plant here in Kalgoorlie and the permanent disposal facility back up in Malaysia? So as with everything that we do, we follow the process. We dot our I's, cross our T's. We do the work. We do the work in the community. So we are meeting all of our obligations and we are meeting our deadlines for submissions. In Malaysia, you've got a, a new prime minister now who seems supportive, but you've also got uh, that uh, long-standing critic of, of an MP up there. Uh, how are you handling that? I think there's uncertainty in everything you do. I mean, who would have predicted that COVID would have hit and we were going to shut down. But again, you, f you focus on mitigating the risk and we have very good relationships throughout Malaysia. We have very good relationships with Japan. We have very good relationships with Australia. So we do what we can to mitigate it and we keep doing what's best for the business and the community. So we skipped over uh, the advance from <laughs> Westfield. It's ancient history. And it is ancient history. But how confident are you going forward that your register is stable and that you are in a position to defend any future advance from anyone. Investors will always act in their best interest. 
our job has been and will be to make sure that investors have all the information they need to act in their best interest, whether it be retail investors or um, institutional investors, we communicate with them regularly. With the capital raising, um, we had a lot of interest and in some of the new investors that came on board are long-term value investors and they're well informed. So if a bid comes across that's in the investor's best interest to take, it's our job as a board to, to recommend it to them, but that's what we stay focused on. And I think if you look at what happened with West Farmers or even now, the investors made their own decision about what was best for their portfolio. Central to your growth strategy is this cracking and leaching plant that you're building in Kalgoorlie. Now, in order to fund that, you've done a major capital raising. Why did you go to the equity markets rather than uh, the debt markets or even uh, borrowing from a government? So, government loans are um, generally take a very long time to negotiate and come about. Um, although if you look at the history of Linus, having the debt from the Japanese government has been excellent for us. They're a very strategic investor which helped us through some of the tough times. Um, there was, there's so much uncertainty. Because they're customers as well. The, 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 it's a strategic investment. So Japan was probably the first to realize the strategic importance of the supply chain. And that's why they invested in us early, which other governments are now waking up to. But if I look at the decision that was before us, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. So if you take on debt in an uncertain market, you still create volatility for your shareholders. You create uncertainty for your shareholders. By raising this money, particularly because we have a hard deadline for this investment, we, we de-risk the project for our shareholders and we de-risk the license conditions for Malaysia. The other big opportunity you've got is this phase one contract from the US government to build a new heavy rare earths separation plant in the US. What happens next with that and is anything going to be different under a Biden administration? So, so the interesting thing about um, rare earths and critical minerals is it has bipartisan support. And so that hasn't changed and we are, we are executing against the contract that we have with DOD now which is a design engineering and market study and the deliverables are due in 2021 and we're confident we'll meet the milestones. Interestingly I note that CEO Amanda LaCasa said even if you don't proceed with uh, heavy rare earths extraction in the US. You are still committed to doing it somewhere in the world. Is there interest to do that in places like Europe? Every government is interested in having secure supply chains at this stage. You obviously have a very good working relationship with Amanda Lacaz. What's she like? She's actually really easy to work with in most ways because she is incredibly competent and incredibly broad. Um, and she's got quite a good relationship with her team and so a lot of a lot of the and she's she's open and transparent so there are no surprises so you really you know what's going on you have access to talk to the, the management team so as a board director the key risk for you is if you don't know what's going on um, and she's very transparent so that makes it easy she's also very high energy and opinionated but the rest of the board is also high energy and opinionated so we have very very robust discussions which I value, I enjoy. And Kathleen, obviously you do sit as a non-executive director on a number of important boards, including uh, Blue Scope and, and REA, Aristocrat. Now that you're chair of Linus, uh, how are you going to balance all of that? I, I find it interesting that people ask if I'm overboarded. Um, when I was at BCG, I worked 60 hours a week. And I have a lot of capacity. And, and I work, you know, when you're in consulting, you work across multiple industries every day. So I have a lot of capacity. And so for me, it's, it's not a full load. And I work whenever I need to work. So whether I work at night or I work on weekends, I do what needs to be done. So it's, it's, not, it's not a challenge for me to handle that. Kathleen Collin, it's been great to talk. Thank you. Thank you.